to Walking on the Lean Side, part of It Matters Radio. Today, I have a wonderful guest with me. His name is Martin Puchner, and he wrote, this is the British version of the book. It's called The Written World, How Literature Shaped History. And it also is available uh, in a different edition from Edward's Random House, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. And now Martin is a professor, and he's a Wien, no relation to me, it's spelled W-I-E-N, professor uh, of English and comparative literature, and I believe drama too, at Harvard University. And yes, folks, I know I'm a Princetonian and I shouldn't be talking to people from Harvard, but hey, sometimes they even get good people there, right? Actually, <laughs> accident. Accident. by accident, yeah. Um, now, he is perhaps best known because of his in, the Norton Anthology of World Literature. Uh, and if you go on Amazon or to Barnes or wherever and you look for that, you'll find this incredible collection of, of some of the best literature from all of the world, over the world. And you can also go to the Harvard X online classes and listen to his lectures. Uh, and most importantly, you can read this fabulous book. So with that introduction, hey, welcome and thank you so much for joining me today, man. Thank, thank you, you so much for having me. Now, let's start with a very simple notion, world, world literature, world-based literature. What that because you write about what how that came to be as a notion, yes. And what's surprising, surprising about it is that what surprised me is how relatively recent that notion is. You know, my book starts with the invention of writing uh, and the first great text, the get uh, I think of Gilgamesh 4,000 years ago. So, in a way, I take this idea of world literature back to the very beginning and then look at the big picture of literature ever since. But the idea of world literature, the term, wasn't coined till 1827 uh, in a provincial town in Germany, Weimar, by the then really famous writer and playwright uh, Wolfgang von Goethe. And in his conversation with his secretary, he uh, mused on the fact that he, even though he was living in this provincial town, suddenly had access to a ch Chinese novels and Sanskrit drama and Persian and Arabic poetry. And, and that's when he reflected on that, that that's when he coined the term world literature. And of course, immediately having come up with this notion of world, he did what any smart person would do. He took a junket. Exactly. <laughs> And, 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 and I followed suit. Uh, uh, I, I retraced some of his steps, you, you know, his travels, and, it, it, and, and I t took from it uh, the ethos for my own writing, that, that here I was writing about literature and its transformative power on shaping power in the world, and I felt like if I wanted to do that, I should get out of my study and visit some of the places I was writing about, and I'm really glad I did. Yes. And, and by the way, folks, that's part of what makes this such a wonderful book. Because it's a great read because you do personalize it, even to have get going and being sorted into your house at Hogwarts. Yes. <laughs> that's right. You know, I, I didn't plan on writing about Harry Potter. I, you know, I thought I would be writing about the Epic of Gilgamesh and Homer and the Arabian Nights and also some lesser known texts like the Epic of Sunjata, which I think is a fantastic African epic. Uh, but then as I approached the present, and I was thinking of what are the big shaping texts of our own time? And it suddenly hit me that, of course, there's now an entire generation of people who have grown up with, with Harry Potter. So I, um, I, uh, I binge read Harry Potter and, and immersed myself in that world. And I'm glad I did. And, you know, responses to my book showed that, that this was right. I mean, there, there, I got lots of responses. I, I, you know, I said uh, not critical things, but one or two, maybe slightly snide remarks about Harry Potter. And I think those remarks got the most 
critical response of the entire book. So you have to be very careful with Harry Potter is what I learned. He is, he is, I think in some ways, uh, you, you talk about foundational literature. And in some ways, I think for many people, they see Harry Potter as foundational. Yeah, I think that's right. And, you know, once I started to look for it, uh, I, I was amazed that Harry Potter pops up everywhere. It pops up in, in protest movements. They, you know, they, this generation sees the world through the eyes of that incredibly imaginative universe. And, and it's, it's in people's minds. And that's how they see the world, or it shapes the way they see the world. And therein lies, I think, the core of your book, that what you're talking about when you talk about literature is you give it a very special kind of, I think, meaning underlying it. You're talking about shaping the way people think. You're almost talking about literature as its own epistemological system. That's right. And, and because it's just, it's, it was amazing to me once I started to really put the pieces together to what extent we carry around within us these these fundamental stories, these foundational texts, these story types that really shape the way we see the world. We tell stories about ourselves, we tell stories about other people, we tell stories about the world, and that's how we make meaning. And so I wanted to go back and, and locate some of the most salient episodes from the last 4,000 years. A good example, I think, and one of the first I, I thought about was Alexander the Great. I, I knew I wanted to write about Homer, and it's clear that Homer is this great, fantastic text with so much influence, you don't even know where to begin. But I, I realized that the, one of the people who actually contributed to that was Alexander the Great. And it, it was a great exchange between Alexander the Great and Homer, uh, because on the one hand, Alexander the Great grew up with Homer, and, and when he started his campaign, he took his copy of the Iliad with him, and he slept on it every night, and he really saw his conquest of parts of Asia as a reenactment of the Iliad, that mm -hmm. earlier episode from when, when a Greek army uh, um, captured that town in, in Asia Minor. But then because he was such a fan of Homer and carried his own copy with him far into Asia, he actually contributed also to the success, the subsequent success of this text because, because of Alexander's conquest, so, such a large part of the world was now speaking Greek. And he built cities and libraries and theaters that were all based on, on Homer, including then subsequently the Library of Alexandria. So I realized that here was a perfect example of, on the one hand, how stories shape people's minds and ac actions, and how then, in the case of influential figures like Alexander the Great, they, they in turn give back to literature, if you will, and set the, the, um, the infrastructure almost in the case of language and libraries that, that allowed this one text to thrive and extend its, its reach. Of course, you're talking, you talk about book. He, he has this book that he is sleeping on, and I thought that was a, such a beautiful image. But not all of the literature you discuss starts out as books or scrolls or any written form. And that was part, one of the things I really liked about your book is that you are aware of the non-written literature. And actually, of course, Homer, that, I mean, the elite starts out non-written, as, as does most of the Bible. I mean, it's, or, or, or whatever. But... But even in the modern, more modern days, and you mentioned Africa. Right. Yeah, and, so, and that's so true. I, when I started the book, I realized that I had to think about the transition from oral literature or oral storytelling to, to writing, and I knew it would be a crucial topic in, for the first text I was writing about, the Hebrew Bible, you mentioned Epic of Gilgamesh, Homer. What surprised me was how important oral storytelling continues to be, continue to be for the entire history of literature. I was writing, and, and a great example is Africa. So this, this great 
uh, Af West African epic, the epic of Sunjata, which com commemorates the founding, as many epics do, founding of a kingdom, in this case, a kingdom in Western Africa that existed in the late Middle Ages. Mm -hmm. But the, the text itself, the, the oral story tradition wasn't written down until the 20th century. Um, and, I, and I talk a little bit about different attempts to turn this oral storytelling material into literature. There, there are attempts to turn it into sort of history or myth. There are attempts to turn it into a play. Uh, 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 there are attempts to turn it into a novel. Um, and all of these uh, different choices, translating a much older kind of storytelling into modern literary forms, essentially. And, and I think they all, in some sense, failed until in the 80s and 90s, uh, an American scholar collaborated with a West African singer and he tape recorded him and together they produced a version that they, they then carefully transcribed and, and turned into a kind of literature that, that was closer to the oral storytelling tradition than these earlier attempts. So it's a very interesting and very delicate and fascinating transition when oral storytelling that continues to be so important for so many parts of the world is turned into literature. Well, I, I don't know if you went to summer camp as a kid. I didn't. You did. Okay. But one of the things, of course, we all know is from summer camp that you have these stories that are told around the campfire. Right. And they're told year after year, often by the same beloved counselor. They're often ripoffs of Edgar Allan right. Poe or something, but they take on their own life. And what you realize is, of course, the telling stories orally, they change and they have, and there is a musicality and an inflection mm -hmm. and sound effect and all these things. And of course, the, the trade off for writing things down is that you lose some of that. Right. And I just wanted, before we took a break, to go back that the glory of drama or love you and I happen to share with theater. Um, that the glory of theater is that it tries to take those texts that have been memorialized in writing, but keep that tradition of the aliveness, the orality, the, the tonal, the movement, and keep them alive. That's so true, and and it's uh, it it's a performance. It happens in the present. Stories get recast for a particular audience in a particular time whereas texts produce fixed objects. Now, they are not entirely fixed either because readers come and they bring their own assumptions and, 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 and their own perspective and the interpretation of these texts change over time. And that's a big part of what the book is about too, that, that especially these ancient texts, they get, of course, recast and reused by every generation. But there is that, that struggle between the present reader and these texts that sometimes hail from the distant past and are very strange and and seem remote and difficult to approach. And the glory, I, I really like that formulation uh, of yours, the glory of, of live performance, of live speech, is that it, it automatically gets activated in, in it for a particular group of listeners at a particular time. And we'll be right back. Memoirs from the Asylum by Kenneth Wien, a novel of emotion, madness, life, and the search for freedom. The nurse with the black hair and the bloodshot eyes had propped Marilyn up that morning. She'd coaxed a few spoons of oatmeal or cream of weed or whatever down her throat. Marilyn likes to watch the black-haired nurse with the bloodshot eyes feed her. She's so dexterous with the napkin. The drools and dribbles are wiped away before they can stain her bedclothes. It isn't easy being a schizophrenic. It takes effort to stay hidden. If she makes a mistake, even a little one, she will be found out. See how careful the mouse is to stay still? He hopes the cat won't see him hiding there. But if she sees him, he'll jump back inside the hole where she can't follow him. But the cat did catch the mouse. She'd seen her eating him, throwing him up and down in the air like a little ball until, tired with her game, she snapped his body apart. <laughs> 
The mouse should never have come out of his hole, Marilyn thinks. He should have stayed in there, except when it was rainy or snowy or cloudy or night, or not sunny anyway. That is the best thing of all. It always is. She wonders if she could make a sign warning cats to stay away. Can cats read? That is a question worth pondering. Some of us land in the morgue, some of us land in the asylum, and some of us build our own asylums. It's all the same. It is, in the end, all the same. Memoirs from the Asylum is available in print and Kindle from Amazon.com. Welcome back to Walking on the Wing Side, and today we're talking about the written world. Now, one of the things that I was fascinated about in your book is the scope of what you consider literature. Because when I was growing up, okay, literature was fiction. You expand it. And we've been talking about these foundational texts, for example, the biblical foundational texts, which, of course, only find their true organization, their first order, the Old Testament, uh, when the Jews are in, in, in the exile in Babylon and, and under uh, Ezra. And, and that's a very powerful part of Western history, of course. But... When I was a kid, if you said the Bible was literature, uh, well, that was an F. Yeah. <laughs> right there, F. <laughs> the Bible is truth, and, and it's... Now, we know, of course, that the Bible, as we've been talking about, oral traditions, they get changed, even written traditions get changed. Uh, but it is a different kind of literature than, oh, say, uh, Don Quixote, which is... Absolutely. And, um, and you're right. We, we often think of just as literature as what's on the fiction bookshelf and it's sort of interesting stories and, you know, maybe we pick up a book on, on the air, in the airport to pass the time on the airplane. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but it seemed to me that what, what really the, the, the essential definition, if you will, of literature that, that I came up with was written stories, important written stories. That's, for me, the moment when the book starts, when this or oral storytelling tradition that we've been talking about intersected with, with writing. Um, and once we expand the definition of literature, I'm not trying to say that, you know, the Bible is, is like, is fiction or is like a novel. Not at all, but that what they all have in common is that they're important written stories, and that includes religious texts. And I spend a lot of time thinking about that moment when certain written stories are seen as sacred. It's not something that happened in the very beginning. It was not something that was natural to happen. They were religions without texts, but at some point, certain stories became sacred. And it, it was, for me, the more I think about it, the more I, th the, I think that that was a hugely influential moment. Because today, we live in a world that's everywhere shaped by religions that are based on sacred scripture. Yep. Of course, it's true of the so-called religions of the book, uh, Judea Judaism, Christianity, Islam, but it's true of Buddhism, of, of, of Hinduism, the Jains have sacred scripture. I think... Today, we can't even imagine what a religion would be like without a sacred My text. favorite example of that, by the way, are the Sikhs. Because if you go to a Godhwara, the, the, the shrine is built around exactly. a book. Of course, exactly. so, is the, so in a sense is the Jewish synagogue. Right. Right. Yeah. Uh, right. But, you know, you have one piece of literature in your book that you discuss that isn't a story as such. But you include it, and I think your inclusion of it 
is very fortuitous, very because while I am not a Marxist, although people have accused me of it, <laughs> I think Marx made a lot of mistakes. I think Engels made a lot of mistakes, and God knows its an application in countries has been poorly done. But the Communist Manifesto is, as you point out, a very important piece of literature. And as a psychologist, the thing that struck me was, and that that was expanding your definition of literature in a wonderful way, that literature reaches into our emotions and our capacity to understand the world by adding an emotive part to our understanding. Yeah, that's a very interesting way of putting it. Um, for me, the the primary motivation, I mean, there are two reasons that brought me to the Communist Manifesto. One was that I didn't just, uh, uh, back to the question of expanding the notion of literature, on the one hand, to include sacred scripture. On the, on the other hand, I realized that some of the most important and influential texts are what we would now call political texts, like the Declaration of Independence, and I write about that and the Communist Manifesto. If you look around in the last 200 years, which texts had the most effect, not necessarily positive effect, but certainly the most effect, I think the Communist Manifesto is a good candidate. So I started to look at how it was written and, and try to think about why this revolutionary text, among the so many others that just disappeared more or less without a, a trace, because, you know, in the 19th century, there were so many manifestos and all these revolutionary groups. Why did this group with this one text succeed where so many failed? And I think one reason was that the Communist Manifesto tells a story. So many of these other political texts, they were just, they were lists of demands or a, a call to action. But the Communist Manifesto had those components as well. But it also told a story, it told a kind of breathtaking story from the beginning of mankind to the present and was taking its readers on this wild ride of history, explaining how the present came to be the way it was, and then synthesizing that and offering a solution. And I think that was part of the power of the text. And I think, I think it certainly does deserve to be in the written world how it literature shaped history. <laughs> I'm not a Marxist either, just okay. for the record. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, yeah, of course. And we don't have to necessarily believe any of these stories exactly. as actual or true in order to appreciate them as stories. Exactly. Now, you, you, I was talking with somebody the other day, and I was thinking about your, your book. I wasn't talking about the book, but I, I you, you know, this is an example of how the written word affects the reader, because uh, we Martin Luther came up, and I said to the person, I said, Martin Luther was the Donald Trump of his day. He was to the printing press what Trump is to Twitter. Yeah. yeah, he was certainly, he was a populist. He was the first populist who used a new, relatively new technology to great effect. Um, and what, 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 what was surprising to me about that, that story is that for about 70 years, when, when Gutenberg reinvented print, it had been invented before in China, uh, but when he reinvented print and, and ushered in the, 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 the age of mass, mass production of literature, his first client was the church because the church thought that it would be great to have cheaper Bibles and, you know, large print runs. Uh, uh, but so for about 70 years, the church thought that they owned print and that it, the, this new technology would contribute to its power. And it did for a while. But then they, of course, did not foresee that a new mass technology like print allowed for completely different writing and a new market and new readers and Mark, uh, Martin Luther who started out as a kind of otherworldly friar who was not a populist initially but got into it slowly and then some of his associates said you know maybe we should take some of your sermons and, and your attacks on the post to the printing press mm -hmm. and so he switched from Latin he originally wrote in Latin but then he switched to German the language of the people and mm -hmm. turned out that he had a knack for popular writing and he 
started to dominate the world of print in a, in a way perhaps that Donald Trump uh, now dominates Twitter. Uh, you know, just the other day someone said to me, I, I can't even imagine, certainly can't imagine Donald Trump without Twitter, but I'm starting to not be able to imagine Twitter without Donald Trump. And I think that, that was very true of, of Luther. Um, Luther. Luther's writings composed, I think, about a third of all printed matter in Germany at that time. He really dominated this technology. Yeah, and especially if you if you take out the the copies of the Bible that were being printed, right. exactly. his, his percentage goes up even higher. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. And I think that that is a very interesting point of your book that you inter interweave the stories of the technology, including writing and, and the different types of writing, the the types of books. Uh, how a book is made and whether it, how you fold the paper up or whether it's right. a scroll, what you make the paper, is it paper, are you using papyrus, are you using parchment, uh, all of these differences and how they affect in the, the, the literature and, and, and how they affect the, the availability of the literature and the power of the literature. It, it really does, and that, that is a, a through line, and it, in a way it comes back to my original definition of literature as the intersection of storytelling and writing technologies. And, and that means that if you change one part of the equation, once you change the writing technologies, you're going to change storytelling, you're going to change how stories are written down, how they circulate, how they, how they are read, the forms and formats of these stories. So the, yeah, that became uh, a through line. And in some cases, like print, uh, it, you know, I, I knew that that was an important technology, but I found others that were almost as important that I hadn't thought as much about. And a good example is paper. Well, yeah. Uh, yeah actually, I, you know, I, one of the threads I follow on News 360 is about print. And fascinatingly enough, there's been this ongoing debate of serif versus sans serif yeah. uh, font. What font do you use? Right, right. And, and yes, yeah. folks, uh, those of us who are serious about literature and about writing, we, we can spend a great deal of effort thinking about what modality, uh, some my own work, you know, one of the ways I publish my poetry, which is relatively unheard of, is I do videos with my voiceover or somebody else reading, and then content related to the poetry. Now, when I was a kid, one of the, the really seminal moments in my life was going to hear Carl Sandberg. And Sandberg came out with a guitar. And he read his poetry, performed his poetry, while playing the guitar. Mm -hmm. Now we are back to the oral performance, dra dramatic aspect of uh, of literature and, and uh, of the spoken word, um, um, and and the difficulty, I suppose, of of capturing some of that in in writing and in print and with these technologies. But now, of course, we have YouTube. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. What we're doing right now. <laughs> like we're doing right now. And we'll be right back. The Ripeness of Fruit by Kenneth Ween. Vajria wakes. The sun is not yet up. The cock has not yet called. Perhaps it was the hoot of loons, the stirring of goats in the barn, the restless wandering of the wind among the budding cherry trees. Does the wind taste the tart ripeness of the fruit she wonders? She bends to the fire. Charcoal is dear and they have little. Badria tries to ignore the cold of her hands, the chill that sneaks beneath her heaviest robe. The fire must be used to heat water for Farzam's tea, to heat the rice for his breakfast. For Badria's part, Cold water will do. Whatever warmth lays hidden in yesterday's rice pot will suffice. But Farzam's tea. Where does 
the winter go, she asked herself. When the earth comes back to life, when the nights again are warm and the days glow with heat and desire, perhaps the teacher who has come to the village knows the answer to such questions. She would ask him if allowed, but Badria is not allowed. Women do not speak to men, not even to teachers, particularly not to teachers. It is written, that is enough. The spark catches, the handful of straw flares, a corner of the rich charcoal smolders. While the red heat spreads, she fetches water from the well. The water is clear and cold. She uses some to wash her face. The hem of her garment serves as washcloth. As Badria walks, the wet corner clings to her leg. <laughs> she giggles. Sensation is enough to bring laughter or tears. Badria's body sings. It is the song of life. How could it be otherwise? Even at 11 years, she is woman. Even at 11 years, the child within her blooms. It is written, that is enough. Farzam will soon wake. Where is my tea? He will bellow. She will have it ready. He will be pleased. He will not hit her. He will not curse her father for a bad deal. He will not demand the three goats back. She will be worth the price. Welcome back, folks, and Martin and I were just talking about poetry, and there are two poetic traditions that you discuss fairly extensively in the written world. One is Japan, and the other is in Russia, and I'd really love to hear some of your thoughts about the role of poetry and how poetry connects to prose. And yeah, then, and life's meaning. Yeah, yeah. no, it's, it's a it's a great subject. And one of the things that happened when I I think that happens when you take a kind of bird's eye view of literature as I as I do in the written world, you you notice interesting patterns and differences. A lot of the literary traditions that perhaps we know best, like the the Greek tradition or Mesopotamian tradition, they start with epic, great epic texts like you know the Iliad, the Odyssey, Epic of Gilgamesh those become the foundational texts. What's interesting in this kind of cross-cultural comparison, if you go to China and Japan, they, found, they have foundational texts, but they're not epic narrative stories. They are poetry collections. It's, it's true both of, of China and Japan, and that made a huge difference in how the literary traditions evolved, because that meant that poetry really was at the center of the literary tradition, both in China, where the imperial exam, the exams all government bureaucrats had to had to pass, were really primarily based on poetry, or to a significant part based on poetry. And then that value system, the, the importance of poetry, gets transferred to Japan, which of course is based on Chinese traditions in many ways. And when Japan starts to develop its own independent tradition of, of literature, again, you have the emergence of these great poetry collections. Now, this is all for me sort of the backstory. What, what I focus on in my chapter on Japan is a lady in waiting at the court of Japan uh, by the name of Murasaki Shikibu, who was a lady in waiting and had therefore insight into this closed world, very rarefied, very closed world of the Japanese court. And she knew some literature, but women at the time weren't 
traditionally introduced to the Chinese literary traditions that were so important for Japanese literature. So she had to teach herself secretly by spying on her brother being tutored. And that's how she acquired the steep literary tradition that you needed if you wanted to become a writer in Japan. And, and then she put it to an unusual use. Namely, she started to record what she saw, observed every day at court. And she started to create these chronicles of court life. She set them 100 years in the past so you wouldn't get into political trouble. And then she just kept adding to this. And by the end, she had written over a thousand, today, over a thousand pages, uh, three generations, an unusual text that, in retrospect, we have to consider the first great novel in world literature. Now, the reason why this has something to do with poetry is that included in, these, in this novel are about 800 poems, so-called waka poems, that are related to the haiku tradition, short poems, that the interesting thing that you can tell by reading this novel, The, the Tale of Genji, is that people at court use these short poems basically to communicate. Communicate about anything, about love, about matters of state. People were sending these messages back and forth, and that's how they communicated. But it had a particular a poetic form, and they, they, they're full of illusions. There's part of a kind of in-group that we're using at court, that we're using these poems. And, and that's the great thing about, about this, this novel, Tale of Genji, that gives us insight into this world. And you see how poetry was used every day at court. And, and it, it, the wonderful thing about it, especially when you think about it in terms of love, was that you had to share the illusion. You, you couldn't just write something over here in response to over here. You had to stay and, and connect it. And so right. the use of metaphor right. becomes so brilliant. And that, of course, is the heart of the great Japanese poetry, is right. the use of metaphor. And also another thing is that you had to place it within nature. Right. It had to play, it, it, and again, yes. that's one of the beautiful things about poetry, it, Japanese poetry, is it must be connected to nature, mm -hmm. and it must be connected to time. So you must always have a, somehow a connection to the time of year, to one of the, the five seasons, seasons right. one of the five seasons that Japanese recognize. So the, the, all of this had to go on, and you had this short and formatic methodology and yeah. you had to come up with a, this and and make it so it intersected with the other person so you, you know they're telling you i'm interested in you and then you're kind of saying well yeah i'm kind of interested and, and you're building this romance right these intersecting right. poems and i just thought it was so beautiful and then on the other hand we have what you write about with the Russian poetry. Which yeah. Is a very different use. It's a very different use. And and the reason why it's one of my favorite chapter most for me the most important chapter about Anna Ahmatova, a poet writing under Stalin, um, because of the technological dimension of, of the book that you mentioned and we talked about earlier, that, that, that it is, I write a lot about new inventions, paper, print, and the importance of those inventions, and I believe in that. But I didn't want to write a, a history that was just basically a history of pro progress. New technology is getting better and better. Um, everything is so great. Um, and I, I, so I start to pay attention to moments when there was a pause where, where almost this, this history of, of, of writing technology was, went, was going backwards or sideways. And, and this was a good example because, because of state censorship under Stalin, um, and because poets had no longer had access to the printing press. Mm -hmm. So what, what, what Anna Akhmatova found herself in a position where she couldn't publish officially, couldn't have access to print. So she started to, of course, just circulate poems amongst, amongst her friends. But then she became afraid by hand. But then she became afraid even of doing that because the secret police may break into her apartment and find these, this poetry and she may end up in the gulag or for the, in front of the firing squad. So she started to burn the paper on which she had written her poems after she had uh, learned them by heart. And then she would teach them to a 
group of female friends. They were basically the paper on which she wrote this poetry that tried to capture the what it was like to live in, in the 30s and 40s uh, under Stalin. And so she herself, she was very aware of what she was doing, said it is as if Gutenberg had never in, uh, invented the printing press. It, we live in a pre-Gutenberg era, and and she was very aware of that fact. Um, and yet her poetry and, did live, and her poetry did reach people, just as the oral traditions had, and her words still had power. Exactly. And and it's fascinating to see that even though they, they circulated by word of mouth first, and then in this underground publishing system called Zamistad, uh, that, that, that where, where people were using typewriters to write, you know, to produce maybe 10 or 12 carbon copies of a single text, and they would then pass them around, that this, this dissident writing in the Soviet Union really showed that even if you the state controls the me, the the official media that that the poetry especially uh, but also the novel and other forms of literature sometimes even become more powerful than than they than they do in a liberal society and and that's uh, that's an, a good Ahmato is a good example of that yeah I, I have a friend who came to the States just about when the wall, when the wall fell. And he said to me, he said, you know, Ken, what tore down the wall, it wasn't Ronald Reagan challenging Gorbachev. He said, what it really was, was the introduction of the personal computer. Yeah. Because exactly. once the computer was there, Russia had, the Soviet Union, the government had to choose between allowing people access to information and especially to literature yeah. be or falling behind. And once you open pe the opportunity for people to read and to think and to share ideas, once the marketplace of thought is opened, it works to destroy totalitarianism and it works eventually. It may be a slow act, but it right. is a, a sure act that mm -hmm. eventually it will produce a more democratic form of thought. I think that's right. And that, that is, I think, part of the largest arc of, of the book is that, that all these different technologies have one thing in common, and that they lower the costs of literature. And once you lower the cost of, and that, so that can happen even with just with paper, you don't even need print, but of course print becomes more extreme. And once you lo radically lower the cost of something, really interesting thing, transformative things happen. And that happened every time a new technology, when paper was introduced in, 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 in China and then in the Middle East and then in Europe, when print was introduced in China and then in Europe, there's a real pattern that I see. And, and that is that new populations get access to literature. Uh, that means that there are new stories that are being told before, before new readers in new ways. And and that 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 starts a virtuous uh, cycle of of literacy with more and more literacy, and we are you know we have now reached high percentage of literacy, not complete literacy, but we are we are moving in that direction, and that is ultimately a story of democratization. That and and with all the you know that we talked about populism earlier, there there are difficult things that happen at these transformative moments. There's no question, but. I, I firmly believe that that democratization of literature, and we see that with the internet now, um, just has to be a good thing in the long term. I couldn't agree more. So folks, I've been having the great pleasure today of talking with Martin Puchner, Puchner I want to pronounce it properly. He is the author of The Written World, How Literature Shaped History. Now, this is the British version. That if you go on to Amazon and look for the Martin and for his book, uh, you'll see a different cover, but it's the same book. The, the American cover is a lot more colorful. I <laughs> uh, and uh, it does have, I think, a little better illustrations um, because they're, they're also in color. Uh, but it's a wonderful, wonderful book. 
Now, folks, as you know, I, I read the books that I discuss in this show. Most of them are sent to me by authors. In a few cases, and this is one, I found the author. I read the book. I saw something about the book. I said, I have to read this book. And I found Martin. Actually, I connected with him on Facebook and said, please come on Walking on the Ween side because your book really mattered to me. Uh, and he has been kind enough to join us. I hope you will join him by going and buying a copy of this book, reading it, and discussing it, because it truly will make you more aware of literature, its meaning, its function in our lives. This is a book. I think anybody who wants to think of themselves as educated in the humanities and in the arts and literature really ought to have in your library. Now, you can also look for Martin on the web. He, he does have a web presence, and it's just simply his name, Martin, M-A-R-T-I-N, Puchner, P-U-C-H-N-E-R. And you can learn more about him there. Martin, I, I cannot thank you enough for accepting my friend request on Facebook and for joining me today. And... Uh, again, uh, I really think your book's terrific. Thank, Thank you so much, much for having me and for this wonderful conversation. conversation. I, I learned a lot from it. I had a, a really great time. Thanks so much for the show.